Kanye West is one of the most recognizable rappers of the 21st century, transforming the sound of music through his production style and passionate lyrics. My thing is, when, that, when you get that shot, you need to make an impact. Kanye's defined gravity so many times, he's lasted unusually long at a very high creative pitch for, for over a decade. And, you know, even if he were to stop now, those records would already have had a massive effect on the sound of, of hip hop and of pop and of, you know, how to be a celebrity, how to talk about that, you know, just as a figure, as well as a producer, as well as a rapper. Experimenting with different production styles, Kanye's music changed the sound of mainstream music altogether. However, controversial statements would be a constant factor in his career, affecting his life and causing uproar around the pop culture world. You got the number one rapper in the world! On top of that, Kanye's marriage to Kim Kardashian added another layer to the star's overwhelming fame. The constant hounding of press would affect Kanye's mental state later in his career. It's quite interesting because in an interview with Time magazine, Kanye said that he doesn't actually want to have a legacy. He doesn't necessarily want to be remembered. Well, actually, I think he's going to struggle with that because he is the most creative hip-hop artist. He is the most crazy hip-hop artist. It's impossible not to remember him. But despite his outspoken behavior, Kanye West has changed the world with his sound and image. I mean, it's exciting to get out to perform with all my artists and friends, bring out a couple special guests, and just any opportunity I get to express my music, I, I try to take it. Join us as we explore the genius behind the music and the lyrics. This is the story of Kanye West. Kanye West's ambition in life was always to become a professional rapper. By the year 2000, Kanye was making a name for himself in the music production scene. It would be here that Kanye's career would start. Early on in Kanye's career, he was well known for his interest in um, producing beats and he was actually famous for uh, speeding up samples of, of old soul records and he got a, a lot of um, attention through that and he, as I said he was known as, as a producer but he also had the desire to want to be a rapper um, and be practicing um, was actually pretty good at it but because his background didn't really match the, the gangster rapper image of the times a lot of labels didn't really want to take the risk in him, didn't think he'd sell, and wanted to keep him um, behind the desk doing the production um, and things like that. You know, he didn't have the kind of gangster rap pedigree that these other guys had. At the time, you, it was like you needed to be, I don't know, a drug dealer or have been shot in order to be taken seriously as having any credibility. Kanye was this guy who'd grown up in a very, um, you know, beautiful suburb of Chicago. His mother was a very respected academic. He'd lived in China when he was 10 years old and learned Chinese. He certainly didn't have that kind of pedigree. I remember playing demos for all these different labels and he'll bring different people in and everybody wanted the sound to sound like something that was already out there. And to me, that was blocking. That was a form of blocking your artistic freedom. Not allowing you to just express what you wanted to do and, and, and bring some type of change to the game. Like I always say with di different records like slow jams or Jesus walks in Jesus name on the radio. We were never trying to make radio. We were trying to break radio. That's allowing artistic freedom. Or uh, John Legend's new single, Ordinary People, has no drums on it whatsoever, but it's being played on urban radio. We keep on trying to break records and allow the artists to be free. That's the, that's, that's the whole movement. On the 23rd of October, 2002, Kanye's life was to change dramatically. Kanye had been working late at a California recording studio when he decided to drive home. During the drive, Kanye fell asleep at the wheel, causing a near-fatal car crash. 
Well, you know what happened for a reason. God knew I had a message, he knew I had a mission, but he knew no one cared about me. He said, Kanye, I'm gonna make somebody care about you. Bam, I nearly died. That's one of the best things that could happen to a rapper. This seemed to sort of give him this sense. He talked about that he'd been kind of saved because he's a, he's a religious man. And I think he had this sense, this sort of confirmed that, you know, that he had this sense of purpose and that's why he'd been saved. And people who worked with him said that from then on, it was like a kind of different character. He sort of, he was even more fired up. He was even more purposeful. Kanye used his life-changing crash to his advantage. If anything, it encouraged him to fulfill his ambition of becoming a rapper. Whilst Kanye had his jaw wired shut, he recorded his first single, Through the Wire. Through the Wire was um, Kanye's first big hit, but the background story behind it is actually pretty incredible, that he had a life-threatening car crash um, and wrote and performed the song with his jaw wired shut, hence the name of the track, um, just weeks after he'd had his, his, his jaw wired. Um, so it was very poignant, and I think bands really pick up on, on the pain and the truth behind that track, rather than just a gangster throwaway um, track that a lot of other rappers were putting out at the time. And it was kind of, it was like a superhero's origin story. It was like, uh, you know, Bruce Banner getting exposed to Gamma Ray or Peter Parker being bitten by a spider. It was like this was this kind of formative event and he emerges from sort of almost dying and as a, as a sort of rap star. And it worked, it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. He tells the story of who he's gonna become and he becomes that. Kanye's video for Through the Wire is not one for the squeamish. You see actual footage of his jaw being wired back together. It looks like something sort of from a horror film. Through the Wire, I would say, is actually one of my favourite videos of him because it's quite personal. It gives you a proper insight into his life. Um, it kind of starts off with him and his mum messing around and then it sort of goes on to this pinboard of Polaroids which each kind of show different stages of his life. I spit it through the wire, man. There's too much stuff on my heart right now, man. I gladly risk it all right now. Each Polaroid shows a different stage of his life. For instance, recording in the studio, at him sort of hanging with his mates. He put it together with a lot of great, fun images. You know, there's pictures of Jay-Z, there's pictures of Kanye, there's pictures of them all hanging out. It's very um, unpolished video. It looks like it's something that somebody put together on their own with a phone camera. But that's one of the things that makes it so great because it really is a look into Kanye's life at that time. And he explained the story about how blacks came from glory and what we need to do in a game. Good dude, bad night, right place, wrong time, in the blink of an eye, his whole life changed. But the point of the video is this. There are so many different Polaroid pictures that you see which take him through his life, through his journey, and it shows that he's obviously really thought about where he's come from and probably where he's going. It's made him analyze his life in every single which way. The fact that he was very clever to put that together, that he actually rapped the song while his jaw was wired shut, is something that resonated with people, not to mention the fact that it's a very catchy tune. When he released that song and made the video, it got people's attention. And all of a sudden, the guys he, he knew and was working with started to understand and to start to believe that just maybe Kanye could in fact solo and get up there and do this on his own. Kanye West's first album, titled The College Dropout, was recorded in Los Angeles whilst he was recovering from the accident. Unfortunately, the album was leaked months before its official release. Kanye, however, used this to his advantage, reviewing the album and making changes where he deemed fit. The College Dropout went on to become a certified triple album in the United States and garnered Kanye 10 Grammy nominations, leading to three wins, including Best Rap Song for Jesus Walks. I changed my name this week from Kanye to The Face, which stands for The Face of the Grammys, due to the fact that 10 nominations is the third most in history. And um, from now on, I, I prefer to be called The Face. It was safe to say that Kanye West had established himself as a chart-topping rapper, and he was eager to show that off at the Grammys after party.
for co-writing, for helping me come up with my speech. I want to thank Brooke for helping me come up with my speech. I know they're going to be on the internet like, we should take his Grammys away. He didn't write his speech all, all himself. Uh, I, I love y'all, and y'all know I love to rap, right? So uh, just play, play, play that J-Lo-B right quick. And I'm going to spin a verse for y'all right quick. With the money gained from the sales of the college dropout, Kanye was able to bring a whole live orchestra into the recording session for his second album, Late Registration. A bold move that would change the overall sound of his music. You've got collaborations with people like Jamie Foxx, Adam Levine. You're seeing here that Kanye is respected within the industry because he's got these great names on board, but it also shows that he's developing as an artist with his skill at producing rap as well as melody as well. Late registration sold over 2.3 million units in the United States alone and also broke a record for most digital downloads in a week when the single Gold Digger sold over 80,000 copies. Gold Digger was one of the most successful songs ever and certainly one of the biggest hits of Kanye West's career. I think for mainstream people, people who, like myself, who weren't really rap fans, everybody likes that song. How can you not like that song? It doesn't matter if you're into rap music or not. It's a fantastically catchy crossover tune. And the fact that he got Jamie Foxx to duet with him on it, who at the time was coming off the great success of the movie Ray, where he played Ray Charles, was just perfect timing. For the Gold Digger video, you've got all the ingredients of the perfect rap tune. You've got Jamie Foxx, you've got Kanye, you've got girls, half-naked girls, Joe racing around. It's a basic, basic video, but it sends the greatest message in rap, that if you've got money and you've got cool tunes, that you can get the chicks. It's a fun video. You see Kanye West looking extremely cool with his sunglasses on. There's these kind of magazine front covers running through the Gold Digger video. It's always got a bit of a 1950s sort of influence to it as well. Jamie Foxx is, is there with his sort of suave white suit, looking very, very smooth. Get down, girl, go ahead, get down. Get down, girl, go ahead, get down. Get down, girl, go ahead, get down. He's singing about, you know, these women that we all know of who marry these um, professional basketball players or other rock stars, and the next thing you know, they get it, they have a child, and then they get set up with child support for life. In 2005, Kanye's image changed dramatically. Just days after late registration's release, during a benefit concert for Hurricane Katrina victims, Kanye exposed his controversial views on live television. Kanye West is standing there next to Mike Myers and they are reading a teleprompter talking about the devastation that happened amongst those trying to survive, who had been flooded out of their homes. 
And all of a sudden, Kanye goes way off script and says, um, you know, every time we see a black family running, they, the media says that they're looting and rioting. And when we see a white family running, it says that they're just looking for food. And he said, I don't like the way that this story is being reported. The destruction of the spirit of the people of Southern Louisiana and Mississippi may end up being the most tragic loss of all. George Bush doesn't care about black people. Now, when he says that, it's absolutely hilarious to watch Mike Myers' face because this is a guy who makes people laugh for a living, and he literally looks like he's going to die. Mike Myers' face is like this. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't do anything. Nobody does. Kanye is just ranting away. The producers quickly, quickly cut to somebody else to get Kanye off camera as fast as possible. But because the show went out live, there was no way to edit any of that from appearing. Kanye's comments reached much of the United States, leading to mixed reactions. George Bush would later call it one of the most disgusting moments of his presidency. Kanye's mother said that one of the things he got from his father was this sort of intolerance for injustice. Um, and sometimes that manifests itself in um, a political statement, like after Hurricane Katrina, where famously on a telethon, he said, George Bush doesn't care about black people. And you could tell he hadn't really thought this through. It came out as a sort of blurt. And he had this tremendous power, you know, and, and ended up kind of, you know, the president was well aware of this. It was a nightmare for NBC. They had to issue an apology straight away. It caused an international sensation. It was the biggest headline to come out of the entire thing that Kanye West went on TV and basically called George Bush a racist. Throughout 2005 and 2006, Kanye had been in the studio working on his third album. Kanye wanted to change the sound of his music again. And after listening to songwriters Bob Dylan and Johnny Cash, Kanye wanted to develop his wordplay and storytelling ability. Kanye West's third studio album, Graduation, was a massive success, selling almost one million copies in the first week, beating fellow rapper 50 Cent to top position on the charts. Kanye West was one of the first rappers to really rap about feelings, about intimate things, about matters of the heart. So in the terms of rap, in the world of rap, that was a really big deal. It encouraged men and women to be able to talk more openly through rap about how they felt about their lives and love. Um, but there were many artists that were inspired by him. And obviously you've got people like 50 Cent. Obviously his album was coming out at exactly the same time as Kenny's album Graduation. And he said, that if his album didn't do as well as Kanye's, he would never rap again. Well, Kanye went to number one. 50 Cent was obviously the, the, the loser in the, in the battle. Um, he's obviously still rapping, so. But the influence was there. He wanted to basically be better than Kanye. Absolutely. I'm just curious. I know that you've been going around doing listening groups internationally, and I'm curious to know what kind of feedback are people giving you about the album? What's the vibe out there? Well, the album is very, like, internationally charged. You know, it's fueled by, you know, all the places we visited. You know, Australia, New Zealand, touring with the Rolling Stones, touring with uh, U2, and Vana, Vano was like, Nobody from the community has ever figured this out except for Michael Jackson. And that's making these stadium songs, these songs that, like, you know, connect with people, their, their hearts, their minds, their spirits, 10 years down the line. When you do Through the Wire, it gets just a big, if not better response than, you know, Gold Digger. So this album right here is the stadium status. Like I say on Big Brother, it's just stadium status. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. In November 2007, Kanye sadly lost his mother, Donda West. This profoundly affected Kanye during the whole of 2008, causing a change in Kanye's perspective on life. Kanye was really close to his mother, Donda, um, and her death was actually really tragic. Um, she was 58 years old and just undergoing regular um, cosmetic procedures and sadly she died in, um, in surgery and her death actually caused Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was governor of California at the time, to put a law forward saying that um, patients going under that type of procedure should be 
appropriately screened um, beforehand. Um, in terms of how it affected Kanye, obviously, as I said, he was very close, um, and he found it very difficult to, to deal with that. Uh, his first show after her funeral was actually here in England um, at the O2, and he included a tribute to her in his set, and he continued um, the tribute. I believe he performed Journeys Don't Stop Believing, and he played that on every single day of the tour. So it showed you how much he wanted to celebrate her at his gig. He told me uh, last year that he felt guilty um, because if he hadn't moved to LA and she hadn't moved there with him, that she'd still be alive. Which, of course, is, that's not a rational response. You could always go, well, if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't done that, he's not responsible. But he, he obviously carries that guilt. And, and actually, if you look at his behavior, his online profile, his interviews, uh, in his lyrics, before and after his mother died, they do get more, he gets darker, he gets more provocative, he gets more gloomy, he gets more complicated. Um, I think it was a real sort of shattering event. A year later, Kanye released his fourth album, 808s and Heartbreak, which contained themes of love, loneliness, and heartache. During these recording sessions, Kanye felt rapping couldn't convey his emotions. Because of this, Kanye used auto-tune to help him sing throughout the album. The 808 album was definitely quite a sad record, to be honest, even, even for the, uh, the artwork with the heart um, ripped down the middle. Um, so I think his personal life could have affected that release. I think with the, the use of the synths and the auto-tune, it was as much as him experimenting and innovating with his sound. Across all his albums, he's never stayed the same. He's always kind of mixed it up and tried to do something new with the production um, or the vocals. So I think this was just um, an extension of that. I, don't, I think some tunes paid off. I don't think as an album as a whole it did. Um, but he took the risk and he was able to bounce back anyway. So there was no like long-lasting harm done from experimenting in that way. It went to number one, which was fantastic, but it didn't win a Grammy, which is really telling, considering Kanye is the most Grammy-winning artist ever. With 808s and Heartbreak, he pioneered this idea that auto-tune singing could be as significant as rapping, this kind of new tone of kind of uh, introspective, glum, luxurious, sort of soft rock influence, um, which led to Drake and The Weeknd, so it was hugely influential. His lead single, Love Lockdown, showed a dramatic change in the production style and sound of his music once again. The Love Lockdown video starts with him, I would assume in his apartment, let's say. It's white, it's kind of clinical, he's kind of daydreaming as well. Got Kanye in an apartment, all white, white suit, pristine. And suddenly out of nowhere, you've got this African tribesman coming through almost a bit like an alter ego, perhaps. Maybe Kanye in his crazy battle mode. You know, he has this all white room that he's in and it's almost like he's having this dream-like sequence. And the next thing you know, you see this incredibly uh, majestic African tribe, again, black and white, uh, dancing and doing all this rhythmic stuff and the drums. And it's like all of this is happening while Kanye's in his beautiful home, all white, thinking about someone, uh, dreaming about someone, and this, it's almost representative, I think, of the turmoil and the, the problems that are going on underneath. It's a beautiful video. It's very unusual. It's very attention-getting. And like Kanye himself, it's completely unpredictable. While it was criticized prior to its release, 808s and Heartbreak had a significant effect on hip hop music, encouraging other rappers to take more creative risks with their productions. West's controversial incident the following year at the 2009 MTV Music Awards was arguably the biggest controversy and led to widespread outrage throughout the music industry. During the ceremony, West crashed the stage and grabbed the mic from Taylor Swift. 
in order to proclaim that Beyonce's video for single ladies was one of the best videos of all time. Kanye shocked everyone um, in 2009 when he took the stage at the VMAs and uh, ruined Taylor Swift's um, winner's speech, uh, horrified Beyonce, who he was stepping in on, um, on her behalf, and also shocked most fans watching back home. It was shocking. It had never really been done before, not in this high of a profile scenario. Taylor just looked completely shocked. America went crazy. Even President Obama called him a jackass because he was asked about it later. Taylor Swift at this point, and still is, the nation's sweetheart. She's got the nation wrapped around her finger. This is like the worst thing you can ever do on live television. Some people did try and defend him, saying it's good that a man can speak his mind and uh, fair play to him for that. What's interesting, though, is that if you think about what Kanye was saying, he was totally right. Beyonce's video for Single Ladies, put a ring on it, is iconic. Everybody has knows that video. Everybody knows exactly what that video was. The video Taylor Swift won for, I don't even remember. I don't even remember the, the name of the song she won for. Kanye West was right. It's just that, like, in so many other ways, the way he went about it was completely wrong. He said he got a bit of a telling off by Taylor's mum backstage, and she said uh, words to him that his own mum would have said if the tables had been reversed. Um, and, yeah, he actually got escorted from the, the award ceremony and had to watch the rest from home, so it wasn't a, a great night for him, all things considered. Because of his outburst at the VMAs, Kanye had lost a lot of respect from the press, critics, and the music world. The incident caused Kanye to disappear from the public eye. Yeah, following um, his VMA incident with Taylor, um, it seemed like Kanye fancy taking a different path um, with his life, and he, he actually temporarily moved to Rome, uh, where he did an internship with the fashion brand Fendi. Um, and later in the year, he attended his first uh, Fashion Week show in Paris, and that must have had a big impact on him because he went on to do a collaboration with Nike, um, and he took a much more of an interest in fashion and footwear, um, and his collaboration with Nike um, and the Air Yeezys eventually led to his own line of footwear that has been a big success. His arrogance has maybe got better of him uh, when he called himself the Martin Luther King um, of the fashion world when he um, designed a shoe for Louis Vuitton. So, um, yeah, it's, it's good to know that he, uh, he, he thinks highly of himself and the work that he's doing. So he's um, maybe that Taylor incident did have some benefit after all. After Kanye's fashion adventure, Kanye moved back to Hawaii and started recording for his next studio album. My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, Kanye's fifth studio album, was released in November 2010 to rave reviews from the critics, many of whom described it as his best work that solidified his comeback. My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy was dubbed Kanye's greatest work of all time. And truthfully, it needed to be. He needed to get the public back into his arms. How he did that was by writing music that was palatable for everybody. It was more relatable to everybody. It was tuneful, it was rap, it was a mixture of everything, and it basically endeared him to as many people as possible. It was a, a definite critical and commercial success after 808s and Heartbreak, which was a bit more minimalist, and that was a big departure from his music, a lot of synths, and it was quite a cold album, whereas this was a lot warmer, a lot brighter, bolder. Um, it was kind of returning to the sound that we know him and kind of fell in love with him for. But he also had that, um, those big commercial songs, like all the lights and power that really resonated with fans. And um, I think that was a welcome return to form for him after the 808 album. The record included the international hit, All of the Lights, and Billboard hits, Power, Monster, and Runaway. Following a headlining set at Coachella 2011, that was described by the Hollywood Reporter as one of the greatest hip hop sets of all time, Kanye teamed up with Jay-Z and released the album, Watch the Throne. 
the Watch the Throne album was huge. I think the production really stood out on the album. And as well, the singles um, in Paris and you know, Church in the Wilds were, they could translate from the club to um, just casual listening at home. So if you want to get pumped up for a night out, uh, it kind of suited every single style you could think of. Um, Jay-Z and Kanye, they have different different flows and, and, and stylings, but I think they worked really well together. Um, they knew when to, when one should take the back seat and one should step forward. Um, and they just combined really effectively to, to make one of the best rap albums of the last decade. The album's big single, In Paris, became the record's highest charting single, peaking at number five on the Billboard Hot 100. I think the reason In Paris was so big was it had massive build-up in terms of the, the music leading to that really heavy bass line. But once that came in, it really stole the show. So you had these two great rappers, but it was really the, the bass and the production and the beat behind it that got people moving moving around was such a big hit. And I think it's, it's like one of those classic vocal hooks or riffs. Once you hear that, you know it's going to be a classic. And, and, and they delivered it in that song. After touring the world with Jay-Z on the Watch the Throne tour, West made the news again as he started dating reality star and longtime friend Kim Kardashian in April 2012. It was the beginning of a Hollywood romance that would take the showbiz world by storm. Kim and Kanye's uh, relationship didn't really come as a surprise. Um, they've always been mutual friends. Um, through pals they, that they have in social circles. And Kanye had had a couple of serious but failed relationships um, with likes of Amber Rose. Um, and coming out of that, he he got to see more and more of Kim. They obviously really got on and liked each other and went from strength to strength. And it, it wasn't really long before they started dating and, and made their, their relationship official. They got to know each other a bit better around 2010. She was supposedly dating Gabriel Aubrey, who was Halle Berry's baby daddy, and they had broken up, and Kim went to a Lakers game with Gabriel, and they sat on the floor together. Apparently, Halle Berry was said to be furious about the whole thing and demanded he stop seeing Kim at once. Whatever happened, that relationship didn't last long, and Kim, of course, moved on very famously to basketball player Chris Humphreys. They had a whirlwind romance, and then they had a multi-million dollar televised wedding. Kanye went on later to sing in a rap song that he had fallen in love with Kim around the time she fell in love with him. And he's referring, of course, to Chris Humphreys. So around the time uh, Kim was being courted by Chris, Kanye was falling in love with Kim Kardashian. We all know the story. She went on to marry Chris. It was a complete disaster. And Kanye was there to pick up the pieces. Now, Kanye wasn't single himself during this. He was dating Amber Rose. And Amber Rose has very publicly criticized Kim for, and said that she was sending Kanye naked pictures of herself all this time while he was actually engaged to Amber. So Kim Kardashian was a factor in his breakup with Amber Rose. But according to Kanye West, he had just been in love with Kim Kardashian for so long. And I think in terms of Kim's perspective, I think she never took Kanye seriously as a romantic interest until she was really at rock bottom, picking up the pieces of her personal professional image following her disastrous marriage to Chris Humphreys. And I think Kanye showed himself to be a true friend. I think at first, when they, when Kim and Kanye started going out, um, there might have been a little bit of skepticism around it. Like, a, is this a showman? It's kind of, how serious is it? Because a reality star with um, a huge rap star that has this integrity and is really focused on his image and wants to protect that. Um, but I think it soon became apparent that they were serious about each other. And I think in that uh, moment, she finally started to take him seriously as a romantic love interest, and the rest is history. Um, Kanye came into town, <laughs> and we love that. He can't stay away from you. Um, you said on Twitter, what should I wear? I always ask the boyfriend and get his opinion. Did you ask Mr. West what he thought? I didn't, I didn't. Um, but I should have gotten the, the seal of approval, but he, he likes everything from the collection. And so Courtney, you've always been quite outspoken whenever I've watched you on the show. That's part of the reason I love you. Thank you. Did you do the Courtney test with Kanye and welcome him to the family, like make sure he was good enough for Kim? <laughs> I'm still testing, <laughs> always.
Yeezus, Kanye's sixth studio album, was released in June 2013 to rave reviews from music critics. West touched upon controversial and sensitive topics and delivered a bold record, described as his most confrontational, minimalist, and bravest album to date. Well, I guess with Watch the Throne, you had like, we are kings kind of thing. And then with Yeezus, the title again alludes to, to Jesus, um, which is quite a bold, arrogant statement, but Kanye doesn't really care. He, he, he wants people to know he's the man, he's confident in what he's doing, he's an innovator. The, the cover art of that album was very bare and he didn't need to oversell it, it was what it was. It was just a disc and the music spoke for itself and it was a departure from his previous music. It was a lot heavier, more industrial kind of sound to it. Um, and while it, it did top the charts, it was actually his lowest selling record on release, even though critically, a lot of people were saying it was his best since the college dropout. So it was, it was interesting, but I think that was more down with the music industry in general, rather than the quality of the, the album. Yeezus sold almost 327,000 copies during its first week and the album's lead single, Black Skinhead, was certified gold by mid-October. I think Black Skinhead, uh, lead single from that album, is a very powerful choice. One, you had that driving, real driving beat in there, quite a, an aggressive delivery and from Kanye. But as it, with the title Black Skinhead, you also had the race elements in there. The video for Black Skinhead is quite menacing. It sees Kanye dancing around, shirt off, big gold chain. It epitomizes everything you think of with rap. You see Kanye kind of slinking towards the camera at one stage, completely naked. Um, and it's just a very angry uh, portrayal of, of a young black man who's angry about the way he's seen in the world. And then occasionally you see like, uh, these strange animation figures at the beginning, and then there's like werewolves, you know, popping up. It's very dark, it's slightly gruesome, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But I suppose if you're, you know, artistic enough, maybe you understand it. But it's quite telling because it's him offloading about the big issues in his life. He mentions about the, the problems he has for being black. It also mentions the problems he has for having an interracial relationship with Kim. So this is him kind of offloading, giving his opportunity to kind of say how he really feels about the problems that he faces. He's always been religious, but in, in quite an idiosyncratic way, and certainly an irreverent way, you know, calling an album Jesus, calling a song I Am A God. You know, and, and he has said about that song in particular, and people don't understand that there's a lot of humor in hip hop. And I think sometimes people miss his humor and assume that he's, he's just sort of demented. Um, and a lot of the time he's sort of playing around with, uh, with sort of being, uh, you know, being sacrilegious. And we're taking kind of symbols of uh, the church or symbols of the civil rights movement and kind of treating them in quite a profane way. And that's part of the, the game of hip hop, is, is the, where you, you want to get gasps, you want to rock it, but it doesn't mean that he's not, you know, also on some level a kind of man of faith. The year 2013 also proved to be a personal milestone for Kanye, as he became a father for the first time. With partner Kim Kardashian giving birth to a baby girl in June of that year. When baby Northwest was born, the first question on everyone's lips is this. What are they gonna call her? Northwest. Could anyone have come up with a more crazy name? But it kind of works now, we've got used to it. Kanye has a very controlling nature. It, it, it's involved with everything he does, whether it be his fashion designs, whether it be his music, or whether it be his relationship with Kim. Kim was actually overheard coming out of a very famous LA baby store when she was pregnant with North asking permission of Kanye of what she could buy for the baby. She was sending pictures of everything she'd photographed in the store and asking if it was acceptable for the nursery. Now, this level of interest and control is certainly not one that most dads-to-be would take, but Kanye has very strict rules, even for the way daughter North is dressed. It's black and white, 
It's neutral tones, it's no pink, I, I, except for her ballet tutu. I've never seen that child in pink. He wants her in high fashion couture items, which are made for her, as often as possible. West and Kardashian became engaged in October 2013 and married on May 24, 2014 in Florence, Italy. In April 2015, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian traveled to Jerusalem to have Northwest baptized in the American Apostolic Church at the Cathedral of St. James. There are these amazing pictures of Kim clad in robes, carrying the baby. And I think what's really beautiful about these pictures is you see a sense of togetherness as a family, really gorgeous, but also a sense of tradition. You know, this is a couple that are known for pushing boundaries, but what they've done here is they've gone back and they've really focused on what really matters to them, and that's religion, and that's family, and that's being together, and that's actually really nice. The following month, it was announced that Kim and Kanye were expecting their second child. On June 21, 2015, Kim Kardashian confirmed via Instagram that she and Kanye were expecting a boy in December 2015. On the 5th of December, Kim and Kanye announced their newest addition to their family, a son named Saint West. On the 14th of February, 2016, Kanye finally released his much anticipated eighth studio album. The album went through four name changes before Kanye finally settled with The Life of Pablo. Kanye's in quite a strange phase creatively because he's sort of famed for producing albums which are very complete, cohesive works, very different to the one that came before, um, maybe, you know, dropped unannounced, uh, super impressive. And with Life of Pablo, it was talked about for over a year before it came out. It had different titles. He released singles that ended up not appearing on it, and then they were kind of reinstated. There was this messy launch, and then the confusion over whether it was going to be, where, how it was going to be available, and originally you were going to be able to buy it uh, on CD, and then you couldn't because it was only going to be through Tidal. And then because it was on a streaming platform and nobody actually owned it, he was then able to kind of tinker with it. So there was a sense in which, at one point, you would think, is this record ever going to be finished? Or is he just going to keep working on it? And it's quite a strangely messy, oddly sequenced record anyway. Um, and from somebody that's used to sort of coming out with these quite emphatic statements, it's a strange, there's a strange sort of development, um, which makes me wonder if perhaps there's some uncertainty or self-doubt or what exactly he's trying to achieve by having this kind of constantly unfinished album. It was kind of an evolving, living album, unlike any other album that had come before. Rather than having that official release, this is the end product, it's done and dusted, um, and just enjoy it for what it is, he continued tinkering with it and editing it after it had been released. So the final product wasn't really the final product, it, it, it was evolving. So. That, that was interesting. I think as well with the sound of The Life of Pablo, it was a more organic, maybe family sound. I think you could tell that his home life kind of seeped into that record. There's a lot of like gospel stuff in there and religious references. Um, and it's just like a kind of warm, uplifting album. The album was met with mixed reviews from critics. Rolling Stone magazine dubbed it both a mess and a masterpiece. However, despite the reviews, the album was still able to make it to number one on the US Billboard 200. Yeah, at the time The Life of Pablo was released, it was actually the most successful um, streamed album. It still went to number one in the charts. Uh, it was released only on Tidal um, through his pal Jay-Z's streaming service. Um, but despite that, that limited release, um, it still wrapped up platinum status and was the first album to do so. Later on, it did go to um, Apple Music, and iTunes and Spotify. And, and that helped with this chart's success. After Life of Pablo's release, Kanye's music career seemed to be back on form. However, in late 2016, Kanye experienced a series of events which really affected his mental state. Um, I think one of the major factors that played a part in his mental breakdown was Kim's um, robbery ordeal in Paris when masked armed robbers entered her hotel room, um, tied her up and stole millions of pounds worth of, of, of jewellery. Um, 
Kanye wasn't with her at the time, but understandably it had a massive effect on him knowing that his wife was in danger um, and how shaken up she was with it. Um, and I think that played a, a massive part in his fallout with Jay-Z that, that came after that. Um, there's a video of him at a gig standing on his um, lavish uh, rig that he had above the, the crowd, like Jesus, um, as they all screamed up at him. And he, he cut the music and went into a huge rant um, about Jay-Z having killers and telling them not to send them out to get him. Um, and this all stemmed from, uh, in his mind, he was upset that his best friend hadn't called to give his condolences about what happened or his support. And his wife, Beyonce, hadn't either, and they were meant to be a, a friendly couple. And Jay-Z wasn't the only target um, in that infamous rant that he had. He, he went political on Hillary Clinton, uh, President Obama, radio didn't escape, that, that, that got slammed. Um, and obviously Jay-Z bore the brunt of that, but there was a whole wealth, everyone in the world, it appeared, had done something to rile Kanye. And shortly after that, Kanye canceled his tour and he was hospitalized um, for a period of time where he, he was underwent treatment for his, his mental, mental health and his own benefit, really. A month later, after his rehab visit, Kanye surprisingly met with then president-elect Donald Trump to discuss politics and life. News footage of the meeting showed a peculiar side to Kanye as he just smiled and said nothing during the whole press conference. I think Kanye meeting with Donald took everyone by surprise. Donald wasn't known for being popular among the black community. And to see Kanye visit him um, at Trump Tower um, and then have a rather lengthy conversation and come out and endorse the president was, was quite surprising. Um, I think despite Trump winning the election. Um, I think among Kanye's fans, they weren't too pleased that he had endorsed Trump because of some of the controversial things he'd said. I think his politics, it always comes from a real sense of, of personal injustice, of how he's feeling it. He's not great at empathy. There's a style of political writing where you're really thinking, how are other people feeling? Um, he's not so good at that. Politics is very complex and very potent, but he never behaves in the way I think some people would, would like him to. He's not John Legend, he's not common. You know, both of whom are friends of his. They're very good at doing a more straight down the line, uh, you know, activist message. Whereas with him, it's always tangled up in all these other issues. On top of that, Kanye was still getting involved with online Twitter controversies, having a go at a variety of organizations and individuals, such as the Grammys, music critics, and even stating that he is the greatest rapper of all time. It was easy to say that at this point in Kanye's career, his mental state and attitude to life had changed from his early career. One of the things that's really hard to work out with Kanye is how much of his sort of provocations are calculated, you know, t t to sort of to get attention or to make points, and how much is simply him splurging. And I think there's been quite a few cases where somebody has set him off. There's been a there's been a tweet or there's been someone making fun of him on a chat show, and he lashes out. And that to me doesn't seem like a thought through thing. And I sometimes wonder about his stage invasions at award ceremonies. You know, is he thinking in the car on the way there, that's what I'm going to do? Or does it just sort of erupt? And it's, it's probably, there's probably like a bit of both, but I think a lot of his um, more outrageous tweets seem to come from quite, uh, uh, sort of come from the id. And, you know, Jesus is his most sort of id-like record. That's the one that resembles the tweets. It's just him kind of, him uncensored. And then I think he feels that there's a value in being uncensored, so he doesn't then go back and regret or apologize for all these things. Um, but I think a lot of it, it comes out spontaneously and then he justifies it. Um, and some of the stuff I find as a fan 
it's kind of embarrassing. It's like, why are you wasting your time doing that? Why are you feuding with this person? Why are you making this kind of crass remark? Why are you sort of stooping to that? But that's because that's, that's him. That's part of him, that he can make this fantastic art and then make you put your head in your hands with some stupid tweet. I first interviewed Kanye in 2005 when he released his second album, and he was he was very unusual. Um, he was very distracted. I remember he was constantly working on something on his laptop, like approving artwork on his laptop while I was talking to him. But he was still answering. He just you could tell that it was hard to get him to focus, which apparently is a is a thing with him. But then he was also very charming. Before one song, he you know play back to all these journalists and a song called Celebration, and he insisted on personally going around and pouring everyone a glass of champagne so that they could enjoy the song in the right way. Uh, so there was still a kind of accessibility to him. I'd interviewed a lot of rappers, and I was like, oh, this is, you know, he's like a rapper, but he's kind of more, his brain is maybe faster, uh, he's kind of more bombastic and a little more fidgety. And then I interviewed him again uh, in 2015, when, you know, the album that became The Life of Pablo was meant to be ready soon, and it wasn't. And it, it was one of the oddest interview experiences I've ever had because of this sort of... He had this absolute jittery intensity. He was very focused, but there was no sense ever that it was a conversation. It was literally, you would fire a question at him and he'd answer it sometimes in a way you didn't quite understand or sometimes very abruptly and you try to do a follow-up question and it was like, no, I've done that one, next. It had this weird disjointed sort of thing to him. And I felt like a lot had happened, you know, in the interim. He'd had this, uh, you know, a series of controversies. Uh, he'd lost his mother, which was uh, a major event in his life um, for which he felt some guilt. Um, and he'd uh, married Kim Kardashian, which had made him, you know, an even bigger celebrity and constantly scrutinized. And there was just something about him that, that was no longer kind of felt anchored in the real world. It felt like, you know, his head was probably quite an intense place to be compared to the man I met in 2005, who was still sort of recognizable and relatable in some way. After a period of Kanye only hitting headlines for controversy reasons, some positivity was much needed. This came in 2018, when Kanye and his wife Kim announced the birth of their third child, a daughter named Chicago, who was born via surrogate in January. The couple's happy news reached high levels of media coverage, not just because of Kanye's recent trouble, but also because of their daughter's manner of birth and her name. Their third child, Kim, decided to use a surrogate um, rather than giving birth naturally. Kim's always been quite open about why she used a surrogate. Um, she has a couple of high-risk conditions after her, her previous births um, that could cause harm to her and potentially the baby. So her and Kanye explored all the options available to them and they decided that surrogacy was, was definitely the best option for them. Uh, similarly to, to his former pal, Jay-Z, um, the baby names of the Kardashian West clan have come under a lot of uh, media attention. You've got North, Saint, and Chicago. Um, the latest Chicago being a tribute to, to the city that Kanye's from. It's got a lot of um, meaning for him, and um, it's pronounced shy as well for short. And Saint was a, was a difficult one for them because a lot of people thought maybe that's uh, a, a little, potentially a little bit blasphemous. I'm, I'm not agreeing with that, but um, it, it was a little bit out there. And then the first child, North, um, I think as celebrity names go, actually, it's, it's not, not too bad and it goes quite well with the surname Northwest. So, yeah, I think, that, I think all round they've done quite a good job. Despite Kanye West's outspoken behavior, it's hard to deny that he is one of hip-hop's most influential rappers the world has ever seen. Kanye's future may always be uncertain, but it's safe to say that his legacy will live on, 
and his albums will go down in history as some of the most influential albums of the 21st century. Kanye's defined gravity so many times, he's lasted unusually long, a very high creative pitch for, for over a decade. And, you know, even if he were to stop now, those records would already have had a massive effect on the sound of, of hip hop and of pop and of, you know, how to be a celebrity, how to talk about that, you know, just as a figure, as well as a producer, as well as a rapper. But I think the challenge will be that nobody stays at that level. You know, Bowie didn't, Prince didn't, you, you, you can't, Madonna didn't. You can't be the, the nucleus of the culture, as he calls himself, forever. And it will be interesting to see if Kanye can operate at a slightly lower level at some point, because it, it is going to happen. Um, and there's a sense that, that he can't be the center of attention indefinitely. And that is what he always wanted to be. Kanye said that he doesn't actually want to have a legacy. He doesn't necessarily want to be remembered. Well, actually, I think he's going to struggle with that because he is the most creative hip-hop artist. He is the most crazy hip-hop artist. It's impossible not to remember him. He's super successful. So in terms of his musical legacy, it will go on forever. But it's also interesting to now look at his legacy as a dad. He's a husband. He's many, many things. He's an entrepreneur. He's a restauranteur. He's a fashion icon. So in terms of his legacy, it will continue. He will continue to make music and he will continue to shop. I think Kanye West will definitely be remembered as one of the greatest rappers of all time when all is said and done. Um, his production is second to none. Uh, even throughout his, his meltdown that he had, um, it hasn't done too much to dent his reputation. Even his reality star family, love them or hate them, um, haven't done anything to take away from the quality of his music. And I think if he keeps innovating the way he has done, he's going to be remembered as one of the, the best, for sure. Kanye was so important when he came out with a college dropout, um, because at that time, there was seen as this division between the, the big mainstream rappers and the sort of underground, socially conscious rappers. And he pitched himself as the first rapper with a, a Benz car and a backpack, which is a symbol of like underground hip hop. And he really did seem to sort of bridge the gap and in terms of the guests that he used on the, those first two records. He was kind of bringing hip hop together. Um, then his sound became bigger. He was one of the first rappers to use um, sort of European sounding dance music when he sampled Daft Punk. He was the first person to sort of uh, have a lot of auto tune singing along with the rapping and have this kind of morose, uh, fame makes me sad kind of vibe, which inspires Drake and The Weeknd, who's two of the biggest artists now. And it's remarkable how many times he's kind of reset the center of hip hop. Kanye's genius is noticeable around the world, and he will forever be one of the greatest hip-hop artists of all time. Baby, oh, now don't be trying to come around my girl acting like Mr. Friendly and steal the spotlight like Mr. Bentley. I spotted her like Spud McKenzie, and for them fake movies, I paid them Benjis. Get your own, I got Perry's, he got Nicky, he tried to get him a clone. He said, yeah, you know you get extra hoes, everything you do Extra cold from the polo fleece to the Jesus piece. I got family in high places like Jesus needs. Can I please say my peace? If y'all press to death, then I'm deceased. And this one, he got the number one rapper in the world. I said.